Hey, 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 everybody. Thanks for checking out the RCWR show. Show the ultimate fan support and follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at the RCWR show for original merchandise from the mind and hands of yours truly and friends. Head over to cafepress.com forward slash rcwr show go to that next wrestling or concert event in style that's cafepress.com forward slash rcwr show and visit infinity one productions.com the exclusive home for new and exclusive original content such as our 30 with lee series bonus rcwr show episodes and much much more infinity one productions.com that's with an e as in edward put in the actual number one infinity one productions.com yo yo it's your boy jtg aka the author of damn why i write this book and you are listening to rcwr show yo Listen to the RCWR show with Lee Sanders live every Tuesday night after WWE Smackdown, 10 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com for all the very latest in great talk of wrestling, entertainment, pop culture news, and beyond, along with some kick-ass interviews with some special guests. 10 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com every Tuesday night. Can't catch the show live? You can scoop it up on demand and on the downloads on great platforms such as Google Play, Spreaker, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and on YouTube. Just use the keywords, The RCWR Show. A big welcome to everybody. You are checking out a special edition of the RCWR show as we are covering WWE Hell in a Cell. It's our call that match edition where yours truly offers thoughts, opinions, match predictions slash preview on WWE pay-per-views with an occasional TNA pay-per-view thrown in there but this go round we are talking wwe hell in a cell that's going to be coming to us from the td garden in boston massachusetts on sunday october 30th just one day before halloween i've been looking very forward to talking about this pay-per-view event offering my match prediction ideas i know at the time that we're putting this out you all are checking this out via the website at infinity one productions.com as it's going to be several hours maybe even a day before it launches on youtube as well so for those of you that have gone out of your way to check this out on the downloads via our website humbly i appreciate it thank you guys so much without further ado let's go ahead and let's jump right into it man so we've got not one not two but three count them three Hell in a Cell matches, which all revolves around a WWE title with the exception of two titles. Of course, I'm talking about the WWE Cruiserweight title and the WWE Raw Tag Team titles. But this Raw theme, this Raw roster event known as Hell in a Cell coming to us from Boston, Massachusetts. You know, Boston is a pretty raunchy crowd as it is. They let their voices be heard as far as what they like and what they do not like. I don't know about you guys, but I'm actually looking forward to to this pay-per-view card let's jump right into it man so we've got our pre-show match which consists of cedric alexander lince dorado and sin cara they're going to be taking on the team of tony nice drew gulak and Arya davari it's going to be a six-man tag team match we've seen little bits and pieces on monday night 
overall drop between all of these guys within recent weeks, but really not enough to really make you feel like you want to check out this match. And I don't like saying that to you guys, so please don't come at me with the hate messages throughout social media, please. But just really take a step back and think about how these guys have been utilized in particular since they've been on the Raw roster from several weeks back. Because what? The Cruiserweight division to Raw was introduced back in September, wasn't it? So I don't like saying that about these guys, especially Cedric Alexander, who work his work I've been a huge fan of it since his time in Ring of Honor so I expect still really big things to be happening for this young man in his career in the WWE as far as the future goes but for me I'm just kind of looking at what's going on with all six of these men in particular it's still a honeymoon period for them in the WWE I just the way I've been Honestly, looking at this, it just feels as though the powers that be, I don't know if it's maybe Vince, if maybe it's Triple H or what, but I just kind of feel like it's a touch and go situation with a lot of these guys to try and figure out, okay, who really needs to be sticking around to make up for this cruiserweight division. I think even the bigger question one needs to ask looking into these guys that are going to be doing this pre-show match is, which one of these guys could potentially break out as a single star, whether it means they'd be able to break out as a single star in the cruiserweight division, or maybe they should be going mid-card status, heavyweight status, that remains to be seen. But I think we can all be in agreement. When you look at a guy like Tony Nese, well-gifted, great freaking look, nice physique, Honestly, he really, I would not have him in the cruiserweight division right now because he just has a look, you know, he, he's right up there with like a Seth Rollins, I personally feel. He's right up there with a Dean Ambrose. He's right up there with a AJ Styles. Now, look, I'm not talking about talent. Make no mistake about what I'm saying. Has nothing to do with the talent. I'm just saying as far as his size goes. And if we want to kind of take it a step further. Just based on the work that I've seen of him on the independents prior to WWE. He has shown to me that if he's given the opportunity. He can take the ball and kind of run with it a little bit. But he is definitely at that right age for the grooming even though he's been doing his thing now for a good amount of years really since as far back as the i would say start of the 2000s he's still rather young only 31 still pretty much moldable as far as wwe is concerned but he's definitely one out of the cruiserweight division i see a lot of great potential land Cedric Alexander is another one. I think we can all be in agreement. The Sin Cara experiment, it failed miserably. Lince Dorado, I see a lot of great promise in him. So, honestly, I, I really wouldn't be too surprised if, with regards to this six-man tag team match, if the team of Cedric Alexander, Lince Dorado, and Sin Cara uh, were to go over. But I think, honestly, Mark how I'm looking at this match, I think this is just still a honeymoon period. Powers that be in WWE just really trying to see who the WWE fans are rooting for, who maybe is still a little bit on the fence, like the fans are still out on that, or what's the saying, the jury is still out on some of these individuals. But if I were to just fast forward maybe six, seven months from now, all these names that I just mentioned, I really would not be surprised if Drew Guliak gets released. I wouldn't be surprised if Arya Davari gets released. Sin Cara, I think, is probably going to stick around just a tad bit longer. But really, I think the guys you all need to be paying very close attention to that could be impact players for a few years to come. Tony Nese, Lince Dorado, and Cedric Alexander. You know, another thing that just really kind of like is mind-boggling for me when I look at this match in particular, I can't help but think back to what had came about on Monday Night Raw where we had saw my man Rich Swan defeat 
Brian Kendrick in the middle of the ring. There was no distraction going on whatsoever, at least not that I can recall. So you kind of look at that and you're like, wow, this guy defeated the number one contender that's supposed to face TJ Perkins for the Cruiserweight title at Sunday's pay-per-view. Like, wow, what does this do for Rich Swan? And I got to be honest with you guys, just kind of keeping up with the consistency. I'm a little bit perplexed that Rich Swan has not been thrown into this because within recent weeks, WWE has kind of given the impression that they're really behind Rich Swan, especially to put him in such an interesting position that they put him in this past Monday night. So keeping that in mind, if it was me personally, if I was booking this match, I would actually have a scenario come about during the pre-show. And Lord knows these pre-shows, they usually last about an hour long anyway. I would maybe have some type of a uh, backstage segment come about where Sin Cara, he's on his way to go see Cedric and Lindsay. When all of a sudden, Tony Nese, Guliak, Davari, they do a three-on-one mud stomping on him. Then that kind of puts throughout the rest of the pre-show, well, what's going on with Sin Cara's status? Is he's is he going to be okay? Is he going to be able to go through with the match or what? And then just when you think that maybe it's going to be a handicap match, or it's going to be two on three, we find out that Sin Cara's replacement is none other than Rich Swan. That basically kind of builds up on what Rich Swan had did on Monday night. And it's keeping up with storyline continuity as far as I'm concerned. Not to mention, put him out there in front of the Boston crowd. And Boston is usually a pretty savvy crowd anyway. They know their wrestlers. They know who's been on the independents and all that. They've got a really good feel on who's who. I would just be like very curious to see how they would respond to a Rich Swan. So... If it was me personally, that is how I would be setting it up. But I'm still looking at the team of Alexander, Dorado, Carr is going to be there. Like I said, I personally would have Rich Swan in there. So next match we go. Looks like we have Bailey, who's going to be taking on Dana Brooke. Got a singles match going on right here. I, I gotta be honest, you know, if I were to even remotely look into like what should kick off the pay-per-view, I think honestly what should really kick off the pay-per-view is a Hell in a Cell match. And if you ask me straight up which Hell in a Cell match should kick things off for the actual pay-per-view itself, I would actually go with Roman Reigns taking on Rusev for the United States title. That's just me. I'll come back to that match in a second, but let's talk about Bailey versus Dana Brooke. So this match has been announced. Gotta be honest with you guys, and I truly believe that those of you that have been big fans of Bailey since her NXT days, but especially since she's been up on the main roster, you all will be in agreement with me that this program that she has been involved in with Dana Brooke over the past couple of weeks, it's really been hurting. It's really been struggling. I can go a step further and quite honestly say it's actually been kind of hurting Bailey stock since she's been on the main roster. Dana Brooke has proven time and time again, and I really do not personally care how many people want to tweet me, tell me till they're blue in the face how Dana Brooke is improving. I'm not seeing any improvements right now. I mean, if I were to even remotely try to give her a little bit of a bone at something, I would maybe, just maybe be tempted to say that she kind of is finding a little bit of swagger slash charisma on the roster, but she still just screams identity crisis. I mean, I had on my show one of my best friends in the entire world, uh, Titus Machiavelli, my occasional broadcast partner, the evil genius of professional wrestling. He couldn't even put his finger on what exactly Dana Brooks gimmick is. Okay. So you, you just think about that for a second. I put the challenge out there. 
to Titus. I'm going, hey, tell me exactly what is Dana Brooks gimmick? Because I'm having a hard time figuring it out. It just seems like she's just out there just trying to put something together, trying to make something out of nothing. Even Titus was like, well, that's just her gimmick. She doesn't have anything. So for me to just continue to watch Dana Brooks struggle week after week after week and look, I appreciate the fact that when Bailey came up on the main roster, I thought that was a great way to introduce her to the WWE universe. They basically had her get involved in that program with Charlotte for the women's title. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that thoroughly. I thought she went over big time. I was under the impression for sure that Bailey was just from then on now going to be involved in somewhat of a short term program with Charlotte where she was going to be chasing after her for the women's title. I never thought along the way that in just a small handful of weeks, Charlotte would lose the title to Sasha Banks, right? And you're like, what, wait, wait, what? What? I I don't under, but look, things are kind of ended up the way that they're ending up for very good reasons. But I have just, with what I've been seeing the past couple of weeks with Bailey, Dana Brooke, everything really culminating in what we got from this week's Monday Night Raw. That segment was brutally a very bad segment. I do not blame the crowd in Minneapolis, Minnesota for booing that segment. And let's make no mistake about it. Bailey was not the one getting the boos. Dana Brooke was the one getting the boos. Let's really make sure we home in on that. That's really what this was all about. And just to kind of follow up on what I said on this week's The RCWR Show... They need to be done with this Bailey Dana Brooke program with the quickness. Now, just looking at how things are kind of going right now, honestly, I would have Bailey go into this match. I would have her win just unanimously. I would let there be no doubt about it. I would have Bailey come out with a really really good strong performance now the one thing that we need to home in on is earlier this week storyline wise bailey was showed was uh favoring her right shoulder and she had it taped up and everything so you're kind of getting that you're kind of given that impression that bailey is possibly going to be going to this match a little bit banged up She's going to try to sell that. I think that's the best way you should kind of do it right now. Maybe kind of make it seem as though Bailey is at a little bit of a disadvantage. She's not really at 100%. How is she possibly going to be able to get a victory over Dana Brooke? How is she possibly able to gonna hold it down when she's doing this match? So I think that's the really good story that you can have play out you can definitely tell the story of that tape being around the shoulder of bailey dana brooke pretty much going for that that's how you get the crowd into it you're pretty much giving away the psychology of that match and that's all fine and dandy i think right now that's how you really need to try to protect dana brooke because from what i've noticed if you just do a straight up match with Dana Brooke. Just just have Dana Brooke be involved in a straight up match. She's sloppy in a lot of areas. Very sloppy in a lot of areas. Does not know how to well execute the suspension of disbelief very well. You can see holds and you think that maybe she did one thing and when you get the replays it's pretty obvious she's not even doing it. It's just so she's very very green behind the ears but I think if you tell this story for Dana Brooke and she's homing in on that right shoulder of Bailey's fans can definitely get into it that way but I would definitely have Bailey be on the serious comeback trail uh she would definitely be doing a really dig down deep uh type of performance that's pretty much how i would have it set up Uh, i would honestly love to see her win via submission i know one of her signature moves is a guillotine choke with body scissors i wouldn't mind her 
doing that. Uh, it's okay if she does the Bailey bomb, but at this point, I just really want to see a true dominating, uh, a true statement in this match that Bailey is definitely done with Dana Brooke. Now, some of you guys may have noticed that the beautiful, the lovely, the curvaceous Nia Jax has not been seen on TV within recent weeks. There's two different angles that I would really like to see go down. If it was me personally booking this, it really is coming off as though the powers that be in WWE have faith in Dana Brooke and they just keep giving her these opportunities. I can't tell you how many of our RCWR show listeners have said all throughout social media or in our live chat when we're on the air that Dana seemed to be going off to a really solid start when she was paired up with Emma. A lot of folks really wanted to see Dana get back with Emma and just the way things are kind of looking right now with Emma getting ready to come back on the Raw brand. Seems as though maybe that's not going to be in the cards, at least not for the immediate future. Of course, things could change. If it was me personally setting this up, part of me is kind of thinking that just to kind of keep up with continuity, make things a little bit interesting. Maybe you could have a scenario play out where just when it's looking as though Bailey is about to pick up a really big victory over Dana Brooke, just when it maybe kind of seems as though she's going to be done with Dana, maybe just out of nowhere, you could have Nia Jax attack Bailey. And there you go. You got Dana Brooke and Nia Jax teaming up right there. And they're just owning the hell out of Bailey. I mean, that would be a really great setup right there. And then the alliance between Dana Brooke and Nia Jax is pretty self-explanatory. Both of them hate Bailey. Nia Jax has that long history with Bailey that goes back to NXT. So, I mean, quite honestly, I am all for rivalries that were pretty popular in NXT continuing over to the main brands known as Raw and SmackDown. I am all fine for that. Now, some of you may be looking at that. You may think that's a really good idea. And you may be saying, well, Lee, eventually who could maybe just maybe help out Bailey? And some of you all may be like, oh, Paige. Paige got her surgery for her neck and all that. She's going to be out for several months. So that just pretty much takes care of her. I think what this may come down to is possibly just who exactly may be holding on to that women's title uh, post Hell in the Cell. If it's a case where it's Sasha Banks, then just from what we've seen and keeping up with storyline continuity, Sasha Banks helping out Bailey, teaming up with her, Dana Brooke, Nia Jax, that would be a nice little angle that you can go in right there. But I'm really looking at Bailey picking up the victory but you know the more and more that I that I kind of marinate on things I really do kind of like the idea uh, of a Nia Jax making her presence known in this particular matchup contrary to how some people may want to see Nia Jax uh, play a role in Hell in a Cell later on during the night more on that in a second but for now i'm looking at bailey over dana brooke what could possibly be next for bailey honestly i could see bailey trying to say now that she's pretty much done with dana she wants to get back to business she wants to try to put herself in a position where she's the number one contender for the women's title i could still see nia Jax having something to say uh, about that and again those two girls picking up right where they left off from nxt let's go to our next matchup we got enzo omori and big cast they're going to be teaming up to take on luke gallows and carl anderson it's going to be a regular tag team match everybody that has listened to my show week in and week out know how passionate i feel 
about Lou Gallows and Carl Anderson that it is no joke. I have gone on record on many shows expressing how frustrated I have been with the fact that they've came to the WWE Great momentum that they had going on over in New Japan with Bullet Club. And just when it seemed as though when AJ Styles came into the fold, really looked as though the club, as WWE was dubbing it, was really going places. But that got broken up real quick when it came time for the draft. And Luke Gallows, Carl Anderson, they have just been struggling ever since. And it's quite sad. It's it's really sad. It's just really freaking heartbreaking. I, I'm not really feeling it. I, I'm really not. And the sad part is both of these young men, as I've pointed out on recent episodes of the RCWR show, Gallows and Anderson, they're still relatively young. They are not Dudley boys old. They are not Edge and Christian old. It's a head scratcher. They're not Matt and Jeff Hardy old. I am still just wrapping my brain around this, trying to figure out why isn't Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson given the opportunity. The trigger should have been pulled on them months back to be the tag team champions and to just basically see what's going on with them right now as they are basically enhancement talents. I tell you, when you lose so many times... The stock just goes down and it just kind of gets to that point where amongst the WWE fans, they have a hard time actually buying you as a viable contender as buying that. Oh, oh, well, if they're taking this person on or if these guys are taking on this team, oh, yeah, this is going to be a really good challenge right here. But just the way that these guys have been built up. It's really just been very frustrating. So everybody just love, 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 loves Enzo Amori and Big Kaz right now. And you would think that one way or another, Enzo Amori and Big Kaz, somewhere down the line, they're definitely going to be the tag team champions. Which is why when it comes to this particular match, again, if it's just me, if I'm truly booking this the way that I would like to book this here at Hell in a Cell, I would actually have Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson defeat Enzo Amori and Big Cass. I am positively sure that Big Cass and Enzo Amori, they're going to get a huge pop. From that Boston crowd. Boston is really, really going to be into them. I think they're going to have a lot of momentum riding in their favor going into this matchup. Whereas Gallows, Anderson, I think they're going to get a nice lukewarm reception and everything. But I don't care how much merchandise these guys are selling right now. Look, when it's all said and done, a defeat... Enzo, Amori, Big Cass would suffer, they will be just fine because the WWE Universe is with them through and through, regardless. But Gallows and Anderson, I really feel in my heart of hearts, they need this match more because I still kind of feel as though there is a little bit of unfinished business that they have with the New Day. And if it were up to me, I still, even though I've been saying this for the past couple of months now, I still feel that the way that you need to go about things right now is you need to put Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson in a position where they get that rematch for those WWE Raw tag titles and hook or by crook, they do what they need to do to get those titles off of New Day. If I was personally... Booking this matchup the way that I would have things play out, quite honestly. I would have a scenario come about where uh, maybe we would get eventually some type of a tournament where new number one contenders would be named to take on New Day for the tag titles. And quite honestly, I could genuinely see a scenario coming about where maybe like come Survivor Series... The tag belts are on the line. And honestly, if it were up to me, I would have AJ Styles 
your current WWE SmackDown champion, I would actually have him run interference in the tag matchup with Gallows, Anderson taking on New Day. AJ would be that X factor and he would actually help his boys. Because remember what AJ Styles said. He said it doesn't matter which show we're on. We may be apart, but the club is forever. The club is still intact. We are dominating worldwide. Don't matter where we are, we're going to get what's ours. Because the club rules all. I could see genuinely a scenario like that coming about. And I think they really need that right now because I think ultimately the bigger payoff is going to be in the end to see Enzo Amore and Big Kaz be in that situation where eventually they take the tag belts off of Luke Gallows, Carl Anderson. So to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit, I got Carl Anderson, Doc Gallows defeating Amore, Big Kaz. I could see some type of a scenario coming about where Maybe one of those guys distracts the referee. Maybe there's some type of uh, serious low blow that happens. And the guys are uh, able to do their finishing tag team maneuver that way. That's how they pick up the W. I, I can see some type of shady tactics like that coming about. We were talking about tag teams. I kind of alluded to the New Day. Let's go right to them. New Day could be Big E. Could be Kofi. You know, it, it could be it could be Xavier Woods with Biggie. It, it could be Xavier and Kofi. Any combination, regardless, New Day is going to be putting up putting up those tag team titles against Cesaro and Sheamus. Look, really been enjoying what's been happening with Cesaro and Sheamus. I love that Mick Foley came out in recent weeks and he cut that great passionate promo that he did for those guys. Uh, the fans, they love Cesaro. They love Sheamus. I, I tell you what, if there was ever a monkey wrench of the night with everything that I just laid out in that previous match, this is a match right here where you're kind of looking at this and you're kind of going, hmm, if there was ever a swerve, because WWE likes to do that. They're paying attention to how the betting odds are going and they like to kind of switch it up a little bit, okay? If there is ever a match that you're kind of like, ah, that was a little bit unexpected, this is definitely the match that I would be paying attention to because WWE may pull a swerve on fans and they may just so happen to have Cesaro and Sheamus become your new tag champions. Will it actually happen? Me personally, if I was booking this, I'm making this match go down. Everything that I just laid out with that previous tag match, New Day being as close as it is uh, with the record that they have right now. Who are they getting ready to surpass? Demolition or something like that? So I, I think New Day and the fact that their merchandise sales are still intact. They're still really, really popular amongst the WWE fan base. Sunday night, it's going to be a really great match. But I think just when we thought Cesaro and Sheamus, they were finally starting to get on the same page a little bit. I think Egos is going to get the best of them, quite honestly. And that will be to the advantage of New Day. New Day retains the tag titles. TJ Perkins takes on Brian Kendrick for the WWE Cruiserweight title. Saw an interesting situation come about on Raw this week where Brian Kendrick had pleaded... With TJ Perkins to allow him to win that cruiserweight title at Hell in a Cell because it would mean so much for his family. It would basically catapult him right back up there to where he was before when he was much younger. You know, he, he's got kids he's got to feed. He's got bills he has to pay and all that. He'd be a prize fighter with that cruiserweight title. So, honestly, I see a scenario coming about where TJ Perkins, he's probably going to say to Brian Kendrick, yeah, you want this title? Sure. Sure. Come in the ring and beat me for it. Look, TJ Perkins, big fan of his work. Saw a big bulk of his work in TNA Wrestling. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Saw a bit of his work on the independents. I've always been a fan of TJ Perkins. But what's coming about with him so far in the WWE, 
I think he has a bright career ahead of him, but I still feel in my heart of hearts that the biggest mistake that was made with TJ Perkins is the fact that he is still wet behind the ears when it comes to promos. I still feel that the biggest mistake that WWE made was letting him win the tournament, letting him become the Cruiserweight Champion. I understand that Brian Kendrick, they had the right mentality. Hey, look, Brian Kendrick, you know, he, he's pretty much, he's already a trainer in the WWE and everything. Let him just kind of be that seasoned veteran to kind of help do what they need to do to get the Cruiserweight division to where it needs to be. But when you just really think about who can be that main antagonist right now, to a face cruiserweight champion brian kendrick is the only one right now that fits that mold perfectly and i just personally feel that with everything that's going on currently right now the tj perkins experiment isn't really working that well i feel now more than ever you need to take that belt off of perkins let him chase after brian kendrick for the cruiserweight title and you already have somewhat of some backstory right there so not only do you have perkins chasing after him but then boom you got rich swan who had defeated brian kendrick on raw you can eventually slide him in there once kendrick is done with tj perkins and then boom that's another feud for brian kendrick to get into right then and there tony niece i I buy him more as a good baby face chasing after. I think the wrong baby face is the cruiserweight champion right now. TJ Perkins got the sick entrance and all that. Loving it. I'm loving it. But the mic work, he's got a long, long way to go. Connecting with the fan base, he's got a long, long way to go. Say what you will about Neville, but even Neville for... The fact that this guy has a really thick accent, even he's able to connect more with the WWE fan base. And uh, I will let it be no secret, his work when he was a heel down in NXT, great stuff that was going on. But me, I'm setting up this match. That would be my first title change of the night. Brian Kendrick defeats TJ Perkins, becomes the new Cruiserweight Champion. A lot of rumors surrounding what's going on with that WWE Raw Women's Championship as it's going to be contested inside Hell in a Cell. The big question is whether or not uh, these girls are going to be pretty much putting the book end uh, of the night if they're going to be rounding out the Hell in a Cell event. Reports have it that Vince McMahon is against that idea. Meanwhile, you've got Triple H and others that would love for the girls to pretty much close the night out. Why Vince McMahon is feeling the way that he is feeling, the world may never really know. There's so much speculation that's being put out there. And I don't like dealing with speculations. I like dealing with facts. And the fact is... This is going to be a monumental moment in the sport of pro wrestling, uh, in women's wrestling as we know it right now, to see two girls main event for a major title inside of a Hell in a Cell match, unprecedented, and these two girls... Look at what was done with them and Mick Foley on Monday night. These girls have to live up to the hype. And I saw an interesting image that was floating around on social media. It basically, and kudos to the artist that did this, but they basically had took Charlotte when she does those nice, pretty little backflips and all that from the top turnbuckle. And they basically said, imagine if Charlotte does this, but she does it off of the top of a Hell in a Cell match. A, either she's going to be freaking dead or... Or B, everybody is going to be marking out saying that was like the greatest freaking moment. That was like the greatest freaking women's Hell in a Cell match. Or go a step further, the greatest Hell in a Cell match that they've ever seen. Now, I'm hearing that, and again, I don't like dealing with speculation and rumors. I like dealing with facts, but I will acknowledge because it only seems fair to acknowledge it because I know there's going to be a ton of you guys that maybe want to get my take on this, but I am aware of the uh, report that's out there 
of Sasha and Charlotte. They wanted to do like a really cool, insane spot off of the top of the steel cage at Hell in a Cell. And Vince McMahon just quickly shot that bad boy down. So, I mean, look, whether or not the girls actually tried to pitch something, I think when it's all said and done, if, hypothetically speaking, if they did try to pitch that, kudos to them because I think their mentality is, look, we need to live up to the previous Hell in a Cell matches. There's no telling when something like this is possibly going to be happening again. Let's make the good and right impression if that was something that was talked about and the chairman slash ceo shot that down do i think it's really needed (sighs) see there's that part of me that have seen the previous hell in a cell matches there's that part of me that says yes you kind of need something like that to go down i would hate for this hell in a cell match to just be contested inside of the steel cage structure I i really would just hate that I personally feel that these girls, they need to like be fighting on top of that steel cage. You got to have there be some type of a really wicked spot. You got to put something in there, man. You got to. And Charlotte just seems to be the more smarter wrestler. I honestly, I honestly would love to see Charlotte be in that position where you know like undertaker mick foley i would love for it to be sasha stretched out over the announcer's table and hell yeah man charlie doing that pretty ass little back body flip oh that would just oh but look even if they do not go to that extreme Just think about as a longtime WWE fan, the evolution of where professional wrestling has been for the female wrestlers, you know, and just really appreciate the incredible journey from way back in the day all the way up to where it is now. And quite honestly, and it's really interesting because I remember... I want to say Nikki Bella saying in an interview as early as like last year, she honestly felt that like maybe in 10 more years, we'd possibly see a first ever women's Hell in a Cell match in the WWE. So just to see just a year later from that interview that Nikki Bella gave to where we are right now, it's really a good strong testament to where the women's division is going in the WWE. Uh, I think regardless of what happens in this match, fans will be talking about this for years to come. Both of these girls know that there is a lot of pressure on them. Now the big question, who's going to win this match? Sasha being Boston's favorite since she's right there from the area. A lot of people feel that maybe she's going to be the one to go over. <sighs> I'm a little bit on the fence, man. I'm really a little bit on the fence. Uh, And we need to keep in mind that she is billed from Boston, Massachusetts, but she was born and raised in Fairfield, California. But uh, she did do a big bulk of her wrestling career uh, in Massachusetts for the chaotic wrestling promotion. She had worked with them for a couple of years this is a tough match for me as far as who's going to be walking out of this as the women's champion charlotte has been on such a really really good role i just really personally feel that with these two girls going back and forth i could personally watch these two trade off on that title every couple of months i just really cannot get enough of their feud I want for these girls to just continue to go at it, but I'm really, really feeling Sasha Banks right now. She's gotten a little bit ice cold within the past couple of weeks. I think anybody can back me up on that. We've seen Sasha Banks kind of just be a little bit ice cold, man, whether it's her promos, the in-ring work is there. That's intact, but I mean, for me personally, she just really hasn't been clicking like that for me as the Raw Women's Champion, whereas Charlotte, she just seems to get better 
week in and week out, whether it's in the ring or she's cutting promos. She just seems to be getting more and more into it. She is really evolving and I'm really loving her work. She is on her best A game right now. But when I think about it a little bit more, even more, the reason why I feel that Sasha Banks quite honestly needs this victory more so than Charlotte does. So that's the direction I'm going with. I'm going with Sasha Banks uh, for the win. Now, I did kind of allude to it earlier. I had mentioned Nia Jax. You know, I was kind of thinking about the infamous In Your House pay-per-view where we had Saul Kane make his debut and all that. I was just kind of thinking, like, how badass would that be if, like, both of these girls, they just, like, drain the living hell out of each other. And it's just looking like a freaking slugfest out there as these girls are going back and forth with one another. They're both physically, emotionally, mentally drained. It doesn't seem like these girls got any more left in the tank. And like, as we all are just taking this match, enjoying it, all of a sudden we hear the music, freaking Nia Jax comes out. She somehow manages to make her way into that steel cage structure and she just wrecks havoc. She just destroys the hell out of Sasha and Charlotte and the match just pretty much ends in a way where the referee has no choice but to throw up an X because the match can't continue because Nia Jax, she went to town on these girls and unfortunately these girls cannot continue as a result. And honestly, what better way to bring back Nia Jax than that? Because it just really seems as though she's been forgotten about over the past several weeks. Think about the fact that she was taking on local jobbers here and there. And then, boom, all of a sudden, she just kind of like disappeared shortly after she had won that little feud there with uh, Alicia Fox. Anybody remember that? And we haven't seen her pretty much since then. So that would be a really awesome way to kind of put Nia Jax right back into the mix of things, I personally feel. And you could do that in a way where, you know, just look at that. Just think about that for a second. So you've got Nia Jax still kind of intertwined there with Bailey, Dana Brooke, and now you kind of have her intertwined with Sasha, Charlotte. Do you maybe do some type of a situation where Nia Jax shows up twice and one night? You could go that route. You very well could. Would I personally do it like that? No, I think that is serious overkill. I would have her either get involved in one match or the other. I would not have her do both matches what's really kind of screaming out to me more though is maybe kind of have her slide in there in that bailey dana brooke program i just kind of feel that with sasha banks charlotte it being the very first hell in a cell match yeah maybe you should kind of let that match just play out the way it's going to play out but i would have nia jacks be at the gorilla position just in case the crowd kind of starts to lose interest in it. I would kind of have Nia Jax maybe be that backup plan just in case you kind of need to really make sure you hit a home run to get folks talking. But I don't think it's going to be needed. Sasha Banks, Charlotte, they will deliver guaranteed. Roman Reigns, Rusev, for the United States title, that's going to be contested inside of a Hell in a Cell match. Roman Reigns going into this match. I am expecting nothing more than another dominating performance by my man, Roman Reigns. I really enjoyed what's been coming about with him and Rusev over the past several weeks. But look, man, when it's all said and done... Much as I've enjoyed this feud that's been going on. Roman Reigns, make no mistake about it. This is going to be a slugfest. The way I'm picturing this match playing out in my mind, these guys are going to be like two big bulls just going at it. It's going to be a damn slobber knocker, as JR likes to say. And I I think it's going to live up to the hype. I genuinely, if I'm booking this match and I'm trying to have Roman Reigns really get over with the Boston crowd, because you know Boston. 
past few times Roman Reigns has been in Boston, Boston ain't shown no love to Roman Reigns. I would have Roman Reigns, and I'm telling you, it's going to be a bizarro world out there. I would not be surprised if Rusev gets a shitload of cheers from the crowd as he's beating the holy crap out of Roman Reigns. This is a match I'm going to be paying very close attention to because this, the reactions, it, it could really backfire on WWE. I, I think they maybe did Roman a little bit more harm than good by putting that United States title on him, but... I got Roman Reigns going into this match. I got him taking a serious ass beating. It's going to be such a horrific ass beating that you can't help but kind of like rally for Roman Reigns. But it's all said and done, man. I got him having another dominating performance uh, when it's all said and done. Roman Reigns for your retain. Main event match, we got Kevin Owens taking on Seth Rollins for the WWE Universal title. One main factor you got to put into this is how much of a factor, if at all, Chris Jericho is going to be playing in this match. Because notice since we've gone over the card here so far, Chris Jericho has not been mentioned. So what happens with Jericho? We didn't hear leading up to this pay-per-view that Jericho was banned from ringside. So are you going to maybe tie up that loose end during the pre-show? Are you maybe going to tie up that loose end during the pay-per-view where we see Jericho? How exactly are you going to... Honestly, Boston, I got them wanting to see Chris Jericho. I think it would be a travesty to not have Jericho make some type of a cameo. So the way I'm looking at this match, I definitely can see Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, majority of the match, they're going to be doing their thing. But I see Chris Jericho interfering in this match. I genuinely see Chris Jericho helping Kevin Owens retain the championship. That's just really how uh, I see it playing now. I don't see Seth Rollins getting the WWE uh, Universal title back uh, just yet. N not just yet, especially with everything that's been going on with him and Triple H, Stephanie McMahon and all that. You got to have there be a reason for Seth Rollins to get screwed out of the Universal title. And I just personally feel that that's how you need to do it. You need to have Stephanie McMahon basically... You know, on the hush, allow Chris Jericho to go out there, be in the corner of his best buddy, and pretty much in exchange, Seth Rollins, Chris Jericho, they do what they need to do to make sure that they're representing the Raw brand to its fullest extent come Survivor Series when we're going to have Raw versus SmackDown, basically. I can definitely see a lot of friction between Mick Foley and... And Stephanie McMahon, I could see a scenario playing out where maybe Mick Foley questioned Stephanie on whether or not she knew that Jericho was going to interfere in the match. And I could see Stephanie saying to Mick, no, he just asked if he could be at ringside. That's his friend and all. I, I told him it was fine. I, I didn't know that he was going to do that. And I can see Mick Foley kind of feeling a little bit steamed off, maybe kind of sticking his chest out, kind of asking Steph what the hell is up, and once again, Stephanie McMahon kind of verbally just chopping Mick Foley down <laughs> to nothing but rubble. I can definitely see that coming about, but I see Seth Rollins being screwed. You got to have Seth Rollins. You got to give him a reason to come back out on Monday night, 24 hours later, uh, basically saying, look, you know, I was screwed once again. But see, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I don't really see a lot of people talking uh, about this. With these Hell in a Cell matches, the way that these matches are dubbed, they're grueling. They take years off of your life. Physically, you're never the same after you do a match like this. That's all fine and dandy if you're going to dub it like that. But if you're going to dub it like that, you've really got to hit a home fucking run. And what I mean by that. You need to have there be scenarios where some of these participants in these Hell in a Cell matches, they need to sell the injuries that they sustain. They don't need to show up 
less than 24 hours later, basically, hey, I'm okay. And here I am. I'm in another match. That That is just stupid psychology, quite honestly. You think about Rusev, Roman Reigns, those two, you know that is going to be a freaking slugfest. And quite honestly, if I was doing it right, I would have Roman Reigns show up Monday night, let Rusev sell the injuries. You could basically have Roman Reigns cut his little promo or whatever like that. Don't let him fight that night. Just have him be there. Let him cut a little promo. Talking about how victorious he is. Anybody that wants some, they can come get some. I know that's a John Cena line, but you get where I'm going with that. With regards to Seth Rollins, I would sell the fact that it was a numbers game that went against Seth Rollins. Let him sell what went down with him. At freaking Hell in a Cell, let freaking Kevin Owens, Jericho show up on Monday Night Raw. With regards to Sasha, Charlotte, you pretty much do the same thing. Let Charlotte not show up. If you are going to have Charlotte show up, she can't wrestle. Same thing with Sasha. The champions do not need to wrestle less than 24 hours after being at Hell in a Cell. You got to sell it. The suspension of disbelief. I mean, personally, if I could have it my way, the way that I would really, really do it, especially given the fact that come uh, Monday, it's pretty much going to be what, guys? Uh, a uh, It's Halloween. So there's probably going to be a lot of people that's going to be out trick-or-treating. They're going to be at parties. They're going to be getting their drink on and everything like that. If there was ever a time to not really be in particular about oh i need to have my top guys wrestling this monday night coming up is the perfect time to just let all those champions take a little bit of a rest let them all come back one by one next week that's pretty much how you can do it yeah the ratings would definitely suffer it would suffer big time which is why i'm kind of saying maybe you just need to have some of them not show up And some do show up, but if in my perfect world, you already got three hours as it is, I would definitely pretty much kind of have like all of them pretty much take the night off. And I would just show little highlights all throughout the night of what had came about from that pay-per-view. That is pretty much how I would make up for the three hours. Maybe one of the matches I'd show in its entirety. That's basically how I would do it. And then the next week, back to business as usual. But when it's all said and done, Seth Rollins, nah, sorry, brother. Not on this night. Kevin Owens retained. So, once again, I am looking for your pre-show, Cedric Alexander, Lince Dorado, Sin Cara. I got them over Tony Nese, Drew Gulak, and Aria Davari, Bailey over Dana Brooke, Luke Gallows, Carl Anderson over Enzo, Big Kaz, New Day retains the tag titles over Cesaro and Sheamus, Kendrick defeats TJ Perkins to become the new Cruiserweight Champion, Sasha Banks retains her WWE Raw Women's Championship, Roman Reigns retains over Rusev, and... Kevin Owens retains his universal title over Seth Rollins. Don't forget, coming up this Sunday, October 30th, live on Spreaker.com. It's the return of the RCWR show. We will be doing a special edition as it'll be our WWE Hell in a Cell after show. I'll be giving you guys my live reactions, overall takeaway, deep thoughts, analysis on the pay-per-view as we pretty much set up the events that's going to be coming up for that Monday's WWE Raw. Make sure you're following me on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, Instagram, keywords, the RCWR show. By the way, those of you that's not going to be able to check out that Hell in a Cell after show live, it will be available on the downloads on great platforms such as Stitcher, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio. All the information will be in the episode description of this very episode that you are listening to and or have downloaded right now. So that's going to do it. Appreciate you guys taking the time out to check out this special edition of Call That Match. I'll catch you this Sunday, 
October 30th for our Hell in a Cell live after show. Be safe and be kind to one another. Take care, guys. Thank mm-hmm. you.